Okay, so you saw the title. In this video, I am going to be checking every corner, every small detail on four different quarterback seasons throughout NFL history, lay out all the information so you can finally decide once and for all which quarterback had the single best season of all time. So, yeah, let's just get right into it and start with the first guy, and uh, he's got one hell of a case. To understand what made 2004 Peyton Manning so unique, we gotta go back in time just one year prior when the seeds of what would be his legendary season were planted. In the year 2003, the world was Peyton Manning's oyster, as his stats were dominant during the regular season, and he ended up questionably splitting the MVP with Steve McNair, even though a lot of their passing statistics are a bit one-sided. And in the playoffs, Peyton Manning showed that he was just sick of being in second place, as against the Broncos, I mean, you can see See the stats. He went berserk as the Colts just defecated on the Broncos 41 to 10. But just one playoff win would be as far as Peyton Manning could go for now, as the stars had just yet to align for the forehead himself. Because in the AFC Championship, Peyton Manning would run into the immovable object that was Tom Brady and the Patriots, who at this point had yet to lose in the postseason with Tom now captaining the Star Destroyer. So Peyton just couldn't beat the Patriots, as with a combination of Ty Law picking off Peyton Manning three times as well as unlucky plays like a botched snap on a punt and some lucky Patriot plays inevitably led to the Colts being sent home. So here we are going into the 2004 season where there was a consensus ideology that although Peyton Manning was great he was sort of a playoff choker and Tom Brady was a real man who was out there winning Super Bowls and at the end of the season shiny rings are really all that matters. However little did the public know that during this time Peyton Manning was somewhere in a dark, dark room, sharpening his tools, and was ready to unleash them in the 2004 season. But unfortunately, the Colts' first game of the year was against their abusers in the Patriots, and they were utterly humiliated again, as not only did Tom Brady outplay Peyton Manning on just about every level, but the Colts still would have won the game if Hall of Fame running back Edgar and James didn't fumble on the one-yard line, and the icing on this shameful cake, the Patriots unveiled their Super Bowl banner right in front of the Colts, dragging their nuts all over Peyton Manning's Stonehenge head-ass forehead. But little did they know, the Patriots really screwed up because they lit a fire under Peyton Manning. And from week two on, every single target who came in contact with him was going to be slaughtered on sight. And for the first time, the sheriff became the hunter. Holy lord, that might be the coldest thing I've ever said. Anyway, some of his most notable games, immediately after symbolically getting pantsed in front of the whole class by the Patriots, was a week three semi-shootout between Peyton Manning and fellow Hall of Famer and potential woman respecter Brett Favre. As the game and the season began, the Colts knew they had something special in 2004 Peyton Manning, and let the man cook as he orchestrated a 35-burger dumped on the Packers' heads, and by looking at his stats, I mean... Do I, do I really need to say more? Well, it might be important to know that these were his stats in the first half. Peyton Manning left a graveyard of desecrated bodies in the first half half and coasted for the entire second half, humiliating the Packers by letting Doug Peterson come into the game. So as someone playing at this level, it would take him a while to finally find another worthy opponent, but eventually that opponent would reveal itself in a very pedestrian team in the Kansas City Chiefs in week eight. I guess simply Peyton finally got out played as Priest Holmes, Chiefs running back and fantasy god, buried the Colts early, picking up two touchdowns and holding a massive 31 to 14 lead at halftime. But after playing with his food a little, Peyton got off the bench, dusted off his boots, shined his badge, and put on his cowboy hat and got serious. Instantly, he led the Colts straight down the field, bulldozing through the Chiefs' mediocre defense like Deshaun Watson through the doors of a beauty spa for three touchdowns straight. So unfortunately for Peyton, although it wasn't too little, it was now too late, as Priest Holmes had now almost by himself put the only blemish on Peyton Manning's 2004 season so far. But little did people know at the time that although Peyton would take the L in this game, this would be just the genesis to perhaps the best five-game stretch 
of quarterback play ever. I mean, these were Peyton Manning stats from weeks 8 through 12, as he went 106 for 156 on passing, 1,507 yards, 24 touchdowns, 4 interceptions, and a passer rating of 127.9, and an outrageous 301.4 yards per game, almost 5 touchdowns, and not even an interception. Also, during this five-week stretch by the gods, Peyton Manning won his games by an average of 25.25 points, meaning on average, the Colts won their games by at least four possessions. And just to scare you a little bit more, just remember that most of these games were ended in the first half, so this was just a mere taste of what a prime Peyton Manning was capable of. So after that loss to the Chiefs, Peyton Manning would never lose again in the regular season as a starter, and by the year's end, Manning almost unanimously won the MVP as Peyton's stats of 4,557 yards, 49 touchdowns, and only 10 interceptions are insane, and downright disrespectful to his peers. Like, uh, come on, every single time Peyton dropped back to pass in 2004, there was literally a 10% chance that he just threw a touchdown. And Peyton also loved to spread the wealth in 2004, as the man also got his receivers involved evenly as Reggie Wayne, Marvin Harrison, and Brandon Stokely all broke a thousand yards and double-digit touchdowns. I, uh, th this just doesn't happen anymore. So, it was now playoff time, and after raw-dogging the Broncos again, it was now time. Patriots vs. Colts in the divisional round, with Peyton Manning playing arguably the highest level of football that can be played Will he finally be able to topple the Patriots dynasty? Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, Tom, Tom Brady. Safe to say, uh, the game didn't go well for Peyton Manning, as the Patriots nullified him and his historically great first half performances holding the Colts to zero points all the way up until the last seconds when they could just muster a single field goal, which would be the only points the Colts would manage to put up in this game from hell. So, possibly the greatest quarterback season of all time ended in opposite storybook fashion, as Peyton Manning lost to his abuser, and Tom Brady kept Peyton in the dungeon of torture for just one more season. But although Peyton's arc was a little bit anticlimactic near the ending, don't let that distract you from the wild ride that Peyton Manning brought you on during the regular season, and it just might have been the best season of all time. Okay, put yourself in the mindset of football in the medieval ages, back in the 1980s when, if you can believe it or not, running the ball was actually very important. Uh, fullbacks grew on trees, and the inflated passing numbers of today's era would be considered impossible. Now, also around this time, in the 1983 NFL Draft, an insane prospect in Dan Marino inexplicably slid in the draft, allowing Miami to draft Dan Marino after some, uh, uh, alleged strategically planted coke allegations ended up working, which allowed Miami to draft Dan Marino late in the first round. But when he joined Miami, it took Dan Marino six weeks to finally beat out veteran quarterback David Woodley for the job, where he would finally make his first start in a week six game against the Bills. And in that game against the Bills, immediately he proved that he was destined to be special, but his first pass as a starter was picked off, which, you know, sucked, but he bounced back eventually. He only started nine games in his season, and the Dolphins would go on to lose in the first round of the playoffs to the Seahawks, but with Dan Marino finishing just half of his rookie year with 173 of 296 on passing, 2,210 yards, 20 touchdowns, only 6 interceptions with a touchdown percentage of 6.8%, and an interception percentage of 2, his future was looking bright. But little did those poor 1980s football fans know that the future was the present for Dan Marino, and he was about to show everyone just exactly how talented he was in the present. And in his first game of his sophomore season in 1984, Dan Marino could not have asked for a better stage, as the Miami Dolphins went up against Washington, who had just went 14-2 the year prior, made the Super Bowl, and were also led by arguably the best quarterback in the league with All-Pro and MVP quarterback Joe Theismann in his prime. So with the spirit of a murderous maniac also against a pretty solid Washington defense, Dan Marino 
toyed with them, reducing the skins to dust in a 35 to 17 statement blowout over the defending NFC champs. And the stats between the two QBs in this game are straight up embarrassing. I mean, Joe Theismann was happy to complete even a seven yard check down while Marino was dishing out 75 yard bombs like it was nothing. And just like Peyton Manning, Dan Marino only had to reveal his fangs when it was absolutely necessary. So after ripping through a few more teams with ease, he finally found another worthy opponent in the Cardinals. So this week five game against the Cardinals would include a pretty unlikely passing duel with Neil Lomax, which would of course ultimately end in Dan Marino finishing him off, but still weird that it even happened. Because after a first quarter where nobody scored a single touchdown, the second quarter was an explosion where five touchdowns were scored, giving the Dolphins a lead they would hold on to for the rest of the game. They ended up winning 36 to 28 and Marino was able to dispatch our boy Neil Lomax completely completely overshadowing a very good game for 1980 standards. Anyway, after pillaging some more, Dan Marino and the Dolphins actually ended up falling just barely in a 28-34 loss to Dan Fouts and the Chargers, and even by just a marginal amount, Dan Marino had now lost a game and been outdueled. Finally, with Dan Marino inevitably once more tasting defeat, he was pissed and unleashed his rage on the league for the last four games of the season and did this. In just four games, Dan Marino was almost able to completely surpass his entire nine game rookie year where he made a Pro Bowl. This means that basically one fourth of 1984 Dan Marino was already a Pro Bowl level quarterback. I mean a 10.5 touchdown percentage deserves a criminal charge at least. Also, it's at this time where I should bring up that quarterbacks average just 205.4 yards per game in 1984 compared to the 228.3 yards per game in the modern era. So uh, take a peek at this graph, which shows exactly the moment when passing truly became the main part of the NFL and coincidentally the exact year that that took place in, pretty much right around 1984. So. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. Anyway, when all the smoke settled by year's end, Dan Marino took home the MVP and, and just, just look at this. These seasons by Montana and Fouts were great, but Dan Marino broke just about every quarterback record there was to break this year. The man was a football demigod surrounded by mortals. I can't stress this enough but the numbers that Dan Marino would put up this year wouldn't be surpassed until guys like Tom Brady and Drew Brees came along 30 years later. Also, just one more sucker punch to throw in there, the Dolphins' leading rusher this season was their fullback, Woody Bennett who ran for just 606 yards. So Dan Marino had to orchestrate literally everything on offense. All right, so now that I'm uh, done meat riding here, what did 1984 Dan Marino actually get done in the playoffs? Well, remember when I said the 1983 Dolphins were bounced in the first round? Uh, well, the team they lost to was the Seattle Seahawks, led by a fierce offense with quarterback Dave Craig, Kurt Warner, and Steve Largent, as well as one of the most underrated safeties of all time with a prime Hall of Famer in Kenny Easley. And Seattle was also the fifth best defense overall in 1984, so Dan Marino had his work cut out for him. And by facing the same team he lost to last year, this was the first true test of his career. And Marino and the Dolphins started off pretty slow, with the game being a sluggish defensive battle for the entire first half, with Miami smothering Seattle outside of a 60-yard touchdown to Steve Largent, which kept the game close at 14-10 at the half. But in the third quarter, Dan Marino was just sick and tired of being sick and tired and dug Seattle's grave, leading two drives which led to a short touchdown and a 30-yard passing touchdown to Mark Clayton, while Miami's defense held on to clinch Dan Marino's first ever playoff win. So, after beating Seattle, Dan Marino's next trial would be to face a pedestrian Steelers team that just took out John Elway and the Broncos, robbing us all of a second-year battle between Dan Marino and John Elway. But this game had baggage, as not only did the Steelers get blasted earlier in the year by Miami, but Dan Marino had a vendetta against the black and gold. You see, Dan Marino actually grew up in Pittsburgh, went to high school in Pittsburgh, and went to college in Pittsburgh. So in the 1983 draft, when Dan Marino had already fallen so far in the draft, and the Steelers were on the clock with a 35-year-old Terry Bradshaw as their quarterback one on the roster, Dan Marino was all but sure they would select him. But 
The Steelers didn't. Unfortunately, they took Gabriel Rivera, who would only play in six games before being permanently paralyzed as he was involved in a crash while driving under the influence. Uh, got a little dark there, my bad, but uh, the moral of the story is that Dan Marino didn't love the Steelers anymore, and he was about to lay out all his cards on the table and show the Steelers everything that they could have had. Yeah, long story short, Dan Marino destroyed the Steelers and effectively ended whatever was left of the Steel Curtain era era for the Steelers, while at the same time passing for a ridiculous 421 yards, four touchdowns, only one pick, and had a passer rating of 135.4. Well, here he was. In just his second year only, at the age of 23, Dan Marino had found himself in the Super Bowl. Uh, the only problem was that although the Dolphins went 14-2 and looked unstoppable, the 49ers existed around this time and were clearly the better team. During the entire Super Bowl, the 49ers defense made Marino's existence a living hell, putting heavy pressure on him all game, all while Joe Montana did whatever, whenever he wanted on offense. I wish I could have told you that Dan Marino fought hard and battled the 49ers dynasty down to the last second, but... He didn't. This game was just never close. But wait, just one more thing with Dan Marino, and take this with a mound of salt, but if you were to artificially take Marino's 1984 numbers and adjust them to the average quarterback's numbers of the modern era, this Redditor by Petal Moose found that Marino's numbers would look downright stupid. As if Marino were to play in the modern era, he would have broken almost every record there was, including passing yards, passing touchdowns, and quarterback rating for a single season. Just, you know, if you somehow needed more numbers to realize how demonstrably unreal 1984 Dan Marino was, there you go. Now, if you're someone who prefers dominance through statistics, then 2007 Tom Brady just might be your pick for the best quarterback season of all time by the end of this video. We all know the story of Tom Brady. After a successful modeling career, he gave football a chance and did nothing but win, picking up three Super Bowls in just four years of starting while you know, still giving the people what they want on the side. But what's forgotten is that for some time, it actually looked like the wheels were falling off on the Patriots dynasty, as they did lose key pieces to their team, which ultimately led them to losing to the Broncos in 2005, and once again finally falling to Peyton Manning and the Colts in 2006. So, something had to change. Tom Brady needed more weapons on offense, and uh, what he got was the football equivalent of a hydrogen bomb, with Randy Moss joining the dark side prior to the 2007 season. So, as the year began, what happened? Well, simply put, Tom Brady and the Patriots went to work, getting the job done with efficiency and cruelty, winning each of their first five games by an average of 23.5 points. Also, the Patriots, by the end of the year, had by far the highest point differential in NFL history with 315. So, there's that. Anyway, finally, in week six, the Patriots would find at least somewhat of a challenger with the at the time undefeated Dallas Cowboys in week six, led by Tony Romo, Terrell Owens, and others. So, as Tom Brady started with the ball in this game, he went straight down the field and scored with ease, finding Randy Moss in the end zone. Pretty much right after that, the defense stomps on the Cowboys, which lets Tom Brady get the ball back, and he immediately finds Wes Welker for yet another touchdown. But to their credit, the Cowboys refused to die, never stopping the Patriots on offense, but kept up about as good as you could, even taking a 24-21 lead. Unfortunately, what Dallas failed to take into account was that 2007 Tom Brady was just the Terminator, and a 70-yard touchdown basically would seal the game, and by looking at this QB comparison, this Week 6 matchup could actually be looked at as just barely an above-average game for Tom Brady during this season. So although Tom Brady, for the most part, was just slicing through defense, doing whatever he wanted. He did get a little bit of a scare in a Week 12 game against the Eagles, but his biggest scare came in Week 17 when the Patriots almost lost their undefeated season, and the NFL scriptwriters gave us a little bit of a tease of foreshadowing. In the final week of the season, the Patriots would play against the Giants, and with both teams having nothing to play for, it still didn't matter. They both played at full strength, and the Giants were able to do what no team had done this season. They actually drew blood from Tom Brady and the Patriots, painting Tom as a mere mortal. 
So with Tom Brady actually stifled outside of a Randy Moss touchdown, the Patriots were stuck in the mud for most of the first half, only managing field goals while the Giants, led by Lord and Savior Eli Manning, took a 21-16 lead at the half. And even worse for Tom, the Giants got the ball to start the second half and immediately scored another touchdown, plunging the Patriots into a 28-16 hole, the biggest deficit they had faced all year long. Now, uh, shockingly, Tom Brady with a football in his hands actually does pretty well with adversity, as Tom would go straight down the field, cracking the Giants coat along the way as the Pats would score a touchdown. And uh, on the next drive, Tom Brady would find Randy Moss again for a 65-yard touchdown, saving a potential disaster. So after just barely escaping an embarrassing loss, Tom Brady had now finished statistically the most impressive regular season a quarterback has ever had. As not only did Tom Brady win the MVP, which should have been unanimous if some cheesehead didn't vote for Brett Favre, but he decided to break a few quarterback records along the way, as his most famous record would be the 50 touchdowns that he threw this season, but he also led the NFL in passing yards, passing touchdowns of course, least amount of interceptions thrown with a minimum of 4,000 yards, highest completion percentage in the league, lowest interception in the league, highest passer rating, passing yards per game, and had the best record of all time. There there was not one major statistical category where Tom Brady did not completely dominate in. Y you know what? I, I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, that is, that is one hell of a man. So, in the playoffs, of course, Tom Brady was not going to let this season go to waste, as in their first round, the Patriots played against the Jaguars, and after toying with his prey for a solid minute, Tom and the Patriots eliminated the Jaguars swiftly and humanely, with Brady playing a damn near perfect game compared to David Garrard. I mean, god, two incomplete passes is ridiculous. But to their credit, the Jaguars kept the game pretty close, and it seemed like the only way to at least somewhat weaken Tom Brady was to do everything everything you can to eliminate Randy Moss from the game, and let other guys beat you, as Randy only had a single catch and target in the win. Regardless, the Patriots moved on, and waiting for them in the AFC Championship was, was the Chargers, so uh, that's a free win. Uh, moving on to the Super Bowl, uh, alright, fine, the Chargers are a professional football team, and they actually played this game about as perfectly as they could have, eliminating Randy Moss again, only letting him haul in a single pass for 18 yards. And you know, all jokes aside, this Chargers team should have been the one to take down the 2007 Patriots. The Chargers even came into this game with an injured Phillip Rivers and Ladanian Tomlinson. And Tomlinson in his case was only able to muster just two carries before checking out permanently. But when the game began, things were going pretty incredible on defense for the Chargers, as they did a perfect job tricking Tom Brady, forcing a season high three interceptions all while setting up the Chargers in great field position over and over again. Well, unfortunately, with a hobbled Phillip Rivers, they could only get field goals for the entire game, which allowed Tom Brady's worst performance of the season to be just good enough to take down Phillip Rivers and the Bronze Age knee pad he had jammed in his leg to move on to the Super Bowl. Where, do I even need to say it? Just like Dan Marino before him, Brady fell in the Super Bowl, this time to the biggest underdog in NFL history, as the Giants used the same formula as the Jaguars and Chargers, limiting Randy Moss, and this time utilizing their big guys Michael Strahan and Justin Tuck to make Tom Brady's day one long, torturous state of paralysis. So, he actually lost, and although others may have you believe that this season just doesn't count by default, this season from Tom Brady was special, and it probably will be the best statistical season we will ever see by a quarterback in NFL history. Well, in 2011, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers had massive expectations, as they had just won the Super Bowl as a wildcard team in 2010 and were expected to take over the league. But even with those hefty expectations weighing in, nobody could have foretold what 2011 Aaron Rodgers would have in store. So with Aaron Rodgers supposed to guide the Packers to become the next dynasty, if you're gonna do that, you gotta bleed a little. And literally immediately, a challenger approached themselves as in week one, Aaron Rodgers would face off against Drew Brees and the Saints, the only other guy who would somehow keep pace with him this year. I mean, this game was a legendary regular season classic 
classic, with Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers trading blow for blow for the whole game. Everything was completely even for both teams, down to the special teams' touchdowns, as the Saints and Packers both split with one touchdown apiece. But Aaron Rodgers just never let his foot off the gas, taking a 42-27 lead, leaving very little time in the fourth quarter for a patented Drew Brees comeback. Well, uh, Drew Brees is Drew Brees, and he went right down the field and scored a touchdown. Then, with just a minute left, he went right down the field again, but after handing the ball off, the Saints were actually stuffed on the one-yard line. So, the Packers walked away with a win, and from just this game alone, we could already see just how special 2011 Aaron Rodgers was going to become. I mean, Drew Brees threw for 400 yards and three touchdowns, and he had the lesser game between the two quarterbacks. And after after two more great games, the Packers would pour a 49 piece on Kyle Orton and the Broncos, as Aaron Rodgers just made Kyle Orton look like he didn't even belong in the league. And yeah, although that might have been correct, th this just wasn't moral on any level, as the cheese man double check guy accounted for six touchdowns in total and casually threw 400 yards like it was another day at the office. And this of course activated a downright mythical stretch of six games from Aaron Rodgers where he was on another level. Level, as the Packers remained undefeated and the man was averaging 325 yards per game and more than three touchdowns with a passer rating of 136. For some context on how not okay that stat was, the passer rating on average in 2011 was 84.3. So, yeah. Then, as Aaron Rodgers and the Packers continued on their quest, they wouldn't be caught slipping until week 15 when they played a decrepit Chiefs team led by the one and only Kyle Orton now a chief. And man, this is probably unironically the greatest revenge story you'll ever hear, as for the first time this season, Aaron Rodgers was outplayed by Michael Jor- I mean Kyle Orton, and they lost the game primarily because of Aaron Rodgers' shortcomings. But oddly enough, as the season winded down, Aaron Rodgers would have a near-fatal encounter with the Giants, and uh, just like we've seen before, those script writers love their foreshadowing. But after just barely escaping the Giants, uh, at the time, Rodgers and the Packers finished the regular season strong, and of course, Rodgers in particular took home the MVP, while Drew Brees took home the Offensive Player of the Year award. And as you can see by these three guys' stats this year, this was a historic year for quarterbacks. But still, Aaron Rodgers' efficiency and ability to just win more than any quarterback separated himself from the pack and possibly everyone else in NFL history. Also, just look at the stats. Although Rodgers had way less yards, it was entirely because he attempted damn near 150 passes less than his competitors, while at the same time being more efficient and far less turnover prone. So now, going into the playoffs, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers were favored to go on to win the Super Bowl and at least make it there, but instead they were handed the playoff death sentence that was Eli Manning. And oddly enough, throughout the game, Aaron Rodgers just looked flustered, missing key passes throughout the game while the few passes he did get to his intended target were dropped, as the Packers had four drops in the first half alone. And speaking of the first half, the Giants got a huge momentum swing with a Hail Mary at the end of the first half, and in combination with the four times Aaron Rodgers was sacked, they made the MVP himself look mortal, and the 15-1 Packers led by possibly the greatest single season by a quarterback ever went out in their opening round in sad, sad fashion. I, I moral of the story as usual in these videos, uh, Eli Manning is the greatest player of all time. So, it's time. After looking back at 2004 Peyton Manning, 1984 Dan Marino, 2007 Tom Brady, and 2011 Aaron Rodgers, which of these four quarterbacks climbed more mountains, broke more barriers, and just overall dominated their competition better than the rest, and acclimated themselves as fully deserving of the title as having the greatest quarterback season in NFL history. Oh, man, that, that was a long one. But if you enjoyed this video, then uh, subscribe if you haven't already, because uh, I'm going to be planning on making more high quality content per week. So if you like this video, then watch this video right here where I go over the idea that Patrick Mahomes is already an NFL legend. It's pretty good. Trust me. Anyways, until next time.